Uh, good morning. Um, thanks for coming along. I'd like to first acknowledge uh, we're here on the land of the Gadigal Wangal people, um, on land that was never ceded, and we are showing our solidarity uh, with their struggle for justice. My name is Pip Hinman, and I'm here uh, representing the Sydney Anti AUKUS Coalition as well as the Anti Bases Campaign Coalition. Well, we're here to talk about the recent alarming figures supplied by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute on military spending. These updates have come just before Anzac Day, now steeped in nationalism and mythology, which is, in fact, another good time to reflect on war and what we can do to stop the next one before it starts. The SIPRI figures indicate there has been a large increase in military spending globally at a time when the world faces crises that can be only resolved by political means. Unfortunately, the same pattern is repeated in Australia. Defence Minister Richard Miles told the National Press Club last week that Australia would rise to, uh, Australia's spending would rise to a whopping 2.4% of GDP, up from the current 1.9%. Labor is spending more on the military than it does on public education. A government which truly has our interests at heart would allocate our taxes to help ease the cost of living crisis, fix the bro broken public health system, as well as housing and welfare. Excessive spending on defence is a product of a bipartisan approach um, to the US military build-up in Southeast Asia. But as Defence Minister Miles admitted last week, it's not actually about defending Australia. He said no country was about to invade. It's actually about forward defence. Bipartisanship from coalition and Labor governments puts US foreign policy first, ahead of our social needs. This has led to catastrophic conflicts such as Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan. And now, of course, we know it's clear that Australia is preparing for another war, this time with China. Today, US uh, Marines, Navy and Air Force are in a position to launch attacks on China from Australia. The government may not even be consulted, certainly the public won't be consulted, as we know, war power reform is yet another broken promise. The AUKUS nuclear submarine deal alone represents a massive increase in military spending, contributing to a rise of 53 billion in the next budget and 100 billion over the 2033-34. The other major concern, of course, is any war with China could rapidly become a nuclear war, a war that no one can win. Well, Sydney anti AUKUS Coalition and anti bases Campaign Coalition stand with the majority of people in Australia who say Australia must remain neutral and not go to war on China. And we're saying so today. We're saying today that the international day to cut spending on weapons, to spend that money instead on a climate transition, the cost of living crisis and the lack of <coughs> affordable housing. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks, Pip. Um, I too want to acknowledge where uh, having this event on Gadigal land and particularly acknowledge the, the impact of the arms trade, the impact of conflict on First Nations peoples across the, the globe, but, but especially here um, in Australia. Of course, it's First Nations peoples who have always felt the brunt of a militarised economy, not least with UK and Australian um, uh, atomic weapons experiments in this country. These figures are genuinely shocking. Um, a world which is already far too militarised increased its global spending by some 6.8% on weapons in 2023 to make a shocking figure of some over $2.4 trillion being spent on arms and ammunition and ways of killing each other. This is an appalling loss to the global economy. Not only is the opportunity cost uh, very real at a time when the globe is facing a climate crisis, Countries like Australia are facing housing and cost of living crises. To see the globe spend $2.4 trillion on new and novel ways to kill each other is obscene. Uh, it also, however, generates further political instability and weapons spending begets more weapons spending. Nations see their neighbours arming and arming response. And what we're seeing is a cycle of excessive military spending of which Australia is playing a, a very real part. It is remarkable to see with these figures that Australia spends almost twice per capita what Russia spends on weapons. Just think about that for a moment. Russia 
with its multiple conflicts, its war in Ukraine, spends only a little over half per capita of what Australia spends on weapons and the military. We live in one of the most benign security environments on the globe. And yet despite that, we have the two war parties in Canberra, Labor and the Coalition, egging each other on to spend more and more of our collective wealth on weapons. The Australian public deserves that spending on fighting the climate crisis, on reducing the cost of housing and dealing with their day-to-day -day insecurity with a cost of living crisis. And yet both Labor and the Coalition are predicting more and more of our collective wealth being spent on weapons. And when you look at the spending in the region, you think about countries that face genuine geopolitical risks. It is remarkable to see Australia spends more than double what Taiwan spends on defence. Just for a moment, compare our geopolitical positions. Taiwan in the position it is in the South China Sea with all the security risks it, face, it faces, spends less than half what Australia spends on defence. I mean, that is, should be a moment of reflection for the Australian public and a moment of reflection for both Labor and the Coalition about the excessive spend that's already in the system in Australia, let alone their proposals to increase it by another um, 25% in coming years. You also, when you look at these figures, realise what an outlier Australia is in terms of our global um, total, political, uh, total military expenditure. Australia, with our economy and our population, spends more on weapons than countries like Brazil or Canada or Spain. How is it that the political consensus in Canberra is to drive Australia further and further down this militarised path. These figures should be a moment for reflection in Canberra. They should be a moment for reflection by people across the globe who instead of, uh, who, who want to see their governments invest in peace, not invest in war. Last year, the globe spent more than $2.4 trillion on arms and ammunition in different and novel ways to kill each other. Imagine if we spent $2.4 trillion on fighting hunger, $2.4 trillion on fighting the climate crisis, $2.4 trillion on bringing us together as a globe. That has to be the goal of all of those who believe in peace. That goal will not be addressed through pathways like AUKUS. That goal is harmed through proposals like Australia investing in the nuclear cycle. Um, and, and we have a lot of work to do to turn our country away from this path of warmongering. The great um, technique that um, Miles and others have used is the technique of fear. And um, it seems to be incredibly effective. How, how do you suggest that um, Australians feel, be made to feel more secure and uh, less fearful of Asia and uh, China in particular? Well, the Australian public should have a sense of fear. They should have a sense of fear about the war that their political leaders are trying to drive them into. Australia has no geopolitical interest in going to war with China. Uh, Taipei is some 7,000 kilometres from Canberra. Beijing is closer to London than it is to Canberra. Yet the Australian political leadership of both the Labor Party and the Coalition seem desperately committed to dragging Australia into a geopolitical conflict between China and the United States. Projects like the AUKUS nuclear submarines make no sense in defending continental Australia, make no sense in defending the approaches to Australia. The only purpose for the AUKUS submarines is to enmesh the Australian military as part of the US military uh, attack and the US military response to China. Far from keeping us safe from conflict, that very investment is intended to draw us in to the next war that the United States chooses. Everyone in the world follows the international rules-based order, even Australia, whereas um, our opponents apparently don't follow the rules-based order. I wonder if either of you could comment on rules. I noticed Richard Mulls used that a lot in his uh, National Press Club speech. Um, yeah, I think uh, I th actually think the Australian public can see through the hypocrisy. Um, I think uh, 
we're looking at um, excuse after excuse mm. after excuse being made for why Israel has to, quote unquote, defend itself while it raises Gaza to the ground and starts a big attack on the West Bank. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, I, 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 I honestly don't believe, I don't know how they can keep a straight face when yeah. they keep using that <coughs> phrase because the polling that is being done is showing us, like the latest Lowy Institute poll, which is it's not a pro progressive think tank, it's a more conservative think tank, uh, polling on uh, would Australia support a variety of um, approaches to China, what would happen if uh, China launched a war on ta Taiwan. A minority is saying that we should get involved in some way militarily. And, and the majority is saying we need to remain neutral and we should accept refugees and all the rest of it. So I, I actually think a lot of people are seeing through the so-called rules-based order, which is completely uh, hypocritical. <coughs> yeah. Uh, what, what has become apparent in the last six and a bit months with the war on Gaza is that the West chooses which of those international rules it's willing to defend, which of those it's willing to break, and which of those it's willing to fund other nations to break. Uh, if the Genocide Convention is to have any force, Australia would end its two-way military trade with Israel and would urge our close ally, the United States, to stop funding the genocide in Gaza. But that's an international rule that the likes of Penny Wong and Anthony Albanese think can be just flouted. We see Australia about to join in a joint military exercise with the United States and the Philippines in waters that are claimed by the Philippines under the United, Con United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. I think Australia, like other countries, have a lot to gain from the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea being uniformly recognised. But it is the ultimate irony that Australia is joining with the United States in that when the United States refuses to ratify the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, refuses to be bound by it, um, because they see it as against their strategic interests. The, the utter hypocrisy of the West, the utter hypocrisy of Australia and the United States when it comes to the international rule-based rules -based order is, is pretty apparent to most of our neighbours in the region. Um, and yet the myth in Canberra is that that's the purpose of our military. The purpose of our military is under the Labor Party and the Coalition is to be a subunit of the United States military to impose their power in the region. And they should at least be honest about that. To, to run under the continuing myth of a rules-based order, while our close allies repeatedly flout those same rules, um, is increasingly looking threatening. There's been interesting revelations that Australia is much more basically directly involved in this thing. Um, than is being realised, or is being reported in the mainstream media, namely the use of uh, Pine Gap as a spy base, and also uh, Australia's made military uh, agreements with, with Israel, mm -hmm. which have also not be really been reported. Um, so I wonder if you could mm -hmm. uh, comment on that. Uh, the, the Australian public is not being told the truth by its own government. We have a, a notionally joint military base for the United States in Pine Gap. Uh, but we should be clear about it. It's a US military base that some Australian personnel work at. The Australian Parliament is not told what happens at Pine Gap. The bulk of the Australian government is not told what happens at Pine Gap. And there are credible reports that Pine Gap is a, an important base um, for the targeting of not just US weapons, but the weapon systems of US allies like Israel. Um, the thought that Pine Gap would be used to help better target weapons being deployed against Palestinian people in Gaza is a horrifying thought. And yet, of course, it's given the level of secrecy we have from both the Albanese government and the Biden administration, um, it's, 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 it's a credible and realistic threat that that's happening in the centre of Australia. When you also see our government refusing to release bilateral agreements with Israel to foster uh, the two-way arms trade with Israel, at the same time as we keep getting gaslit by Foreign Minister Wong with her repeated false statements that Australia has not exported weapons to Israel in the last five years, 
it's no wonder that the credibility of the Albanese Labor government is so low, and it's no wonder that people uh, feel generally, genuinely challenged by politicians and are, are losing trust in the political system. If the Albanese government is going to support a genocide in Israel, it should at least be honest about it and frank about it and explain how on earth the Australian national interest is, is furthered in that. As a Green Senator, I can't see how our complicity in a genocide could ever assist our national interest. It's so grossly offensive to international law, so grossly offensive to what I thought the spirit of Australia is. Uh, do you like to make a <coughs> comment about uh, Peter Dutton and others' weaponization of the recent uh, stabbing tragedies uh, to encourage pro-war and anti-immigrant sentiments? I think particularly those of us in Sydney were utterly shocked by the violence that we saw in Bondi Junction and then by the further violence that we saw in Western Sydney. Uh, and, and the thought that Peter Dutton would wrongly seek to characterise that violence as having a, 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 an overt religious or political um, motive in any way connected with a religious movement or a political movement in Australia, I find deeply offensive. But of course, we shouldn't expect any more of Peter Dutton. This is the party that the coalition, which for decades has sought to incite racial, religious and political tensions for its own purposes. It seems that there's no low to which they won't reach. Uh, and I think many people um, uh, join with, not just myself, but, but millions of Sydney siders in particular, to reject that kind of politics. The people who have profited from this, um, <coughs> the, the uh, arms trade companies, have you noticed anything in particular about that, um, in, the, in that graph of, of the people who are profiting from this huge increase of it in, in Australia and uh, uh, weapons sales? Just according to um, Richard Miles, uh, we're going to, rather than produce solar panels or something useful, we're going to be actually producing component parts for death machines. Um, um, so, you know, it is, it, is a, it is a big problem and Australia does aspire to be among the top 10 weapons manufacturers. When you look at the expenditure on weapons, some $2.4 trillion of public money on weapons. I think we should be clear where the overwhelming bulk of that money goes to. It, it goes to global international arms manufacturers um, like BAE Systems, like Lockheed Martin, like Northrop Grumman, um, and like um, the electric boats and HII in the United States, which make not just the Virginia class submarines, but are actively investing in the next doomsday weapon from the United States, which is the Columbia class intercontinental ballistic missile submarine. Um, Australia has committed some $4.6 billion of public money to the US nuclear submarine industrial base, which will be used to not just make attack class uh, submarines such as the Virginia class, but will also be used to make the next Columbia class submarine, which are literally doomsday devices, which carry multiple inter inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, each with multiple warheads, each actively designed to kill millions and millions of people in an instant. And yet Australian public money is being invested into these companies. And, and quite shockingly, where Australia's money has been directed particularly to BAE, particularly to the US um, uh, nuclear submarine industrial base, we have seen significant share price increases to both of those corporations. Um, again, seen billions and billions of dollars profiting a handful of privately owned global weapons manufacturers. Are you happy with Australia's um, manpower shortage in the military being taken up by, by non-Australians? possibly people from the poor Pacific nations. But there's a reason people aren't signing on from Australia to join the military. It's because the mission is confused or dangerous or contrary to what many people would like to devote their life to. 
there is a very real disconnect when you talk to people within the Australian Defence Force between people serving on the ground um, and the ever-increasing number of generals, admirals, air marshals and senior military. Uh, r remarkably, that division seems to be increasing. And if you want an explanation for why people are not signing up to the military in Australia, it's because of that sharp divide between the senior overpaid leadership um, and the balance of the military, and it's because the Australian people are not committed to the same goals that the Australian government wants the, the Australian Defence Force um, to progress. The Australian public repeatedly say they want a Defence Force about defending Australia, not threatening our neighbours. Um, they're unwilling to sign on in large numbers to a Defence Force that the Australian government wants to have as its primary goal, fighting a war against our major trading partner alongside the United States military. Um, in response to this ongoing failure of recruitment, rather than revisit the goals of the Australian Defence Force, revisit the values of the Australian Defence Force, um, reduce the expenditure on, you know, um, uh, the, the officer class, and I'll just note that the head of the Australian military, the chief of the defence force of the Australian military gets paid three times the head of the US military, more than double the head of the UK military in, in, a, in a large S that's unexplained by the political classes. Um, in the face of that recruitment crisis, we see a suggestion that we would recruit non-citizens um, uh, to serve in the Australian military. I think there are real questions to ask about a military that's not drawn from its own people, that doesn't reflect the values of its own people, and the real dangers in seeing um, uh, a recruitment from, from outside the population. Because the ability of a defence force to apply lethal force against its own people is, is, is very real. History can point to multiple examples. And um, I, I think the primary recruitment goal for the Australian for the Australian Defence Force should be from within the broader multicultural spectrum of Australia to reflect Australia's values. Can I just add to that that um, I think you know they should be if, if the recruitment uh, is, is so poor as everybody seems it's an open secret now um, they should be looking internally to see why is the case. Um, the people that I know that are joining are young people who want a free education, they want to be paid while they're studying and they want cheap loans for housing. They don't want to go to war. Uh, they're the ones that I know that are joining. They are decent uh, young people who don't see a lot of prospects mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, they don't join to go to war, they join to do all those other things. Now, if Australia says, well, we're not getting enough of those people, we want, we're gonna, they're gonna be commandeering. They're gonna actually be like commandeering poorer Pacific neighbours, perhaps, into filling the ranks of, 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 of the Australian Army or Navy. I just, you know, people that don't have a choice at all. Yeah. Uh, countries that don't have a choice at all. They've got them over a barrel, so. In 2023, $2.4 billion of public money from countries across the world was spent on new and novel ways for humans to kill each other. That must be a wake-up call to governments and publics across the globe to reverse this trend and redirect that money to things that will make us a more secure planet, will build connections between countries. It starts with climate action. It, it, in countries such as Australia, it also involves critical action on housing and, and the cost of living crisis. But around the world, imagine if $2.4 billion was spent on public health, public education and fighting the climate crisis. Imagine how much more secure we would be.